let's jump right into connectors. First off, there's going to be your motherboard ATX connector. This is either 20 or 24 pins. On uh, mo more modern motherboards, this is a 24 pin connector. Uh, they are backwards compatible, so you can use a 24 pin connector on a 24 on a 20 pin motherboard. Um, and the other way around. However, the other way around might not always work. Uh, in general, you want to use what the motherboard calls for. So it's okay to use a 24 pin cable on a 20 pin socket, but I wouldn't suggest using a 20 pin cable on a 24 pin socket. The next connector you want to worry about is your dedicated processor power. So this is going to be an auxiliary connector on the motherboard, either 4 or 8 pins. The 4 pin is ATX 12 volt, and the 8 pin is EPS 12 volt. Um, older motherboards are not going to have either of these. This was first introduced in uh, Pentium 4, and, uh, but some server motherboards might actually have two, so a 4 pin and an 8 pin. If the, uh, if the motherboard only requires one 12 volt rail, and depending on your CPU, you might be able to get away with only plugging a 4 pin wire into an 8 pin socket. Um, however, this will only work sometimes and it might limit your overclocking capabilities. Um, you can, however, all the time always plug in an 8 pin cable into a 4 pin socket. That'll work just fine, just have 4 extra pins hanging off. In general, just like with the ATX connector, uh, I wouldn't suggest using a 4 pin cable in an 8 pin socket. Just go with what the motherboard calls for. Next type of connector is Molex. These are often used for uh, fans, lights, and IDE drives. They carry a 5 volt and a 12 volt line, as well as two grounding lines. And Mini Molex is the exact same thing as Molex, kind of the same voltages, uh, however it's just a, it's just a smaller connector. Um, these are generally used on floppy drives and occasionally very low power video cards and sound cards. The next type of connector is SATA connectors. So these replace Molex connectors on the new SATA optical drives and hard drives. Basically, in addition to 5 and 12 volts, they also supply a 3.3 volt line. They have 15 pins in total, and they support hot plugging. The way they do this is the pins are uh, staggered in size, so you have three ground pins that connect first, and this is what allows them to be hot plugged. So you, you can plug, un plug them and unplug them while the computer's on without consequence because the ground is always connected before the voltage lines get connected. That's very important. They also have an activity pin that Molex didn't have, and this allows them to do a staggered startup. So let's say you have six hard drives in your computer. Right when you turn your computer on, you don't want them to all start spinning up automatically because right when they turn on, they draw a lot more power than when they're just running. Um, so the way that this is resolved is they have this activity pin, and the system actually turns them on at different rates. So it'll turn on one and then the other and then the other based on uh, what the status of the activity pin is and whether or not the hard drive is spinning. And the last thing you want to keep in mind with these SATA connectors is that a lot of motherboards and power supplies now ship with Molex to SATA adapters. So keep in mind, SATA connectors have the 3.3 volt line, which Molex adapters do not. So the problem you're going to run into with this uh, are not generally significant because optical drives and hard drives are manufactured to not use the 3.3 volt line because of this particular accessory that a lot of people use. However, what you are going to be limited on is the fact that you won't be able to hot plug these anymore because you're losing that ability with the staggered pins that I was talking about. So if you do use this adapter, you're not going to be able to hot plug your drives, whereas if you just plug them right into uh, SATA connectors from the power supply. Okay, now the last type of adapter is going to be your PCI Express adapter. These are uh, 12 volt connections, uh, plus ground wires of course, that are providing auxiliary power to your PCI Express video cards. The reason you often need these is that the PCI Express bus is only spec to go up to 75 watts of power delivery, and a lot of video cards require more than this, especially at load. Uh, so you're either going to have a 6 pin or an 8 pin uh, PCI Express connector. You have to keep in mind the 8-pin looks very similar to the EPS 12-volt auxiliary power for your CPU. Uh, so make sure that you compare them very closely. You shouldn't be able to insert them into each other's slots because they're notched differently, but it is possible with enough force, and doing so will fry something. So you just want to make sure you're careful with that. Uh, and then same thing with the backwards compatibility here um, with 6-pin and 8-pin connectors. On a lot of cards that require an 8-pin connector, you can plug in a 6-pin connector. However, you probably won't be able to overclock the card, and it might limit its capabilities a little bit. You can, however, if space is provided, usually they'll have like two pins that can split off. Uh, you can plug an 8-pin into a 6-pin socket uh, without an issue. 
Uh, the difference between the 6 and 8 pin connectors is that 6 pins are rated to supply up to 75 watts, although in reality they can actually send quite a bit more than that. Uh, and 8 pins are spec to supply up to 150 watts of additional power, um, plus the, uh, the, gr the grinding wires. The, the, the reason they're spec to supply more is they both actually have 3 12 volt uh, wires and then 3 grinding wires, but the 8 pin has 2 additional grinding wires. so. Um, five grounding wires and three 12 volt wires just provides a little bit more room uh, for those power differences. Um, all right, so those are basically all the connectors, uh, all all the standard ones at least. There might be some adapters that you that you've seen for using other stuff. Let's move on to picking out a power supply that's the correct wattage for your computer. First off, you're going to want to add up the wattage requirements of all your components when they're at load. Um, Devices draw a lot more when they're at low than usually when they're at idle, so you want to make sure you take the maximum wattages and add those up. It might help to use something like a power supply calculator. Uh, Newegg, for example, has one that you can use to calculate what wattage power supply you use. I often suggest going about 1 or 200 watts above um, what your math gives you just to be safe. However, you don't want to go too high. If you start going too high, let's say you get a 1200 watt power supply and you're only ever drawing no more than 300 watts. Uh, not only are you going to be spending more than you need to on the power supply, but power supplies operate at a lot lower efficiency when they're not near their peak load. So as a result of this, uh, if you saw the first video uh, in this series, I was talking about how the power supplies convert from AC power to DC power. In that conversion, some power is lost. So like a pretty good rate of conversion is 80% of the power gets converted. But that 80% is only really occurring when the power supply is pretty close to peak load. As it starts to go down from that, the conversion factor drops off, and you could be only converting as much as as little as 20% of your AC power to DC power uh, when you're using very little of the load on the power supply. So that's going to result in slightly higher energy bills because you're not actually getting as much power as you could be. Uh, the next thing is when you're choosing your power supply, keep in mind rails. Uh, I talked about rails also in the first part of this video. You just want to make sure that you have enough amperage and wattage for each component. So. If you're getting a power supply that let's say has three 12 volt rails, you want to make sure not only that you have enough wattage in the entire C, uh, PSU for everything, but that you have enough amperage on each rail to power uh, your 12 volt devices accordingly. All right, and now on to just like a few final specifications to consider uh, when you're purchasing a power supply. First off is mean time between failure. So this is something that's measured on a lot of different components, including hard drives and stuff. Basically, what it means is the estimated amount of time before the device will fail due to overheating or just capacitor failure, anything like that. So you want that to be as large as possible generally. Uh, second thing is dimensions. Make sure it's going to fit in your case. A lot of the new power supplies that are more than a uh, thousand watts, let's say, are pretty big, much larger than the standard form factor. So you want to make sure you have enough room for those. Uh, next thing is power factor correction. There's two types of power factor correction, passive and active. What power factor correction basically is, is it's comparing the real power to the apparent power. The apparent power is calculated by multiplying the amount of current times the amount of voltage. Um, real power is how much, how, much, uh, you can, how much of that you can actually use to do work. Um, so you want that ratio to be as high as possible. With active power, correct, fa power factor correction, you can go as high as 99%. With passive power factor correction, it's going to drop, drop off quite a bit below that. So you're going to want active power factor correction to get, make sure you're getting the most use out of your power supply. Next thing is uh, what it does to protect your components. This is really important. Your power supply is a very important part in your computer because it's isolating your components inside of your computer from the electricity on the outside world. So a few things you want to look for is overload protection, overcurrent protection, over voltage protection, under voltage protection, and over temperature protection. So these are all things that will shut off the power supply automatically if something goes out of the running specifications for the power supply. And a few aesthetic things. Uh, you might want it to have cable sleeving. This is often nice because it keeps the cables bunched together uh, and improves the airflow within the case. also makes it look a little bit nicer. And then also whether the power supply is modular. I'm personally a big fan of modular power supplies. They make it a lot easier to manage the wiring inside of the computer because you only plug in the cables that you need to use.